Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast, AWP. Thank you so, so much for joining me on this episode. Today, unfortunately, it is not a triple threat. It is not even a one-on-one match. Dan, the man, and the commish are not here on this episode. This is just only a solo episode. It is just I, your host, the Shant, and... I actually intend for this episode to be very intimate and very personal because I've been going through a whole bunch of feelings when it comes to just, you know, the wrestling world and what's going on. You hear it all the time now. You will hear it from fans, from superstars, from even the owners of the company about how whether it's WWE, whether it's AEW, whether it's TNA, New Japan what have you, whatever it is that you tune into on a weekly basis or whatever it is that you just keep up with, it is a very unique time to be a wrestling fan right now because there is so much content. There are so many promotions that are giving off so much content on a weekly basis, so many pay-per-views, so many promotions. But I have been, pardon the pun, I've been wrestling with some feelings deep inside ever since this past Sunday's All Out, which was a great pay-per-view. And in my personal opinion, I called this midway through the pay-per-view as I was watching it. The Steel Cage match was the match of the night. That's the show stealer. I felt like those four gentlemen, um, I'm not much of a fan of the Young Bucks, but I felt like they definitely are great performers and the story being told in that match, the psychology, all the spots, all the moments where they make you gasp and awe and the cheers, the jeers and all of it was just awesome. That was definitely match of the night. But for quite a while, I've kind of been in this resentment phase. I am a WWE guy, so a quick introduction. I didn't get into wrestling. I didn't start following it up until 2004. I was in middle school. I was, uh, I had crawled into bed and I couldn't sleep. I turned on the TV and Monday Night Raw was going on. This was around the time when Evolution was still a thing. At the time, it was Batista, Triple H, and just Ric Flair. Randy Orton wasn't in it. And... You had Shawn Michaels, you had Chris Jericho, you had all these guys. And I remember I tuned in and it just, it hooked me. And I just started watching at the, you know, from that point. And then of course I started watching SmackDown with Kurt Angle and Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio and The Undertaker and all those guys. And I just became a big wrestling fan. It became my escape. It became the one thing that I would watch religiously every single week. And I am still a fan of the WWE, but I just feel like I have hit this point where as time goes on, I just have so much resentment, not towards the company itself, because the company is just the company, but I have a lot of resentment towards whoever is in charge of the storylines, the creative aspect of it, the agents, the producers. So... Initially, all of this started when CM Punk made his in-ring debut at AEW. And I remember the first thought that went through my mind. You know, you watch that clip and you see the crowd going crazy. One of the biggest pops in the history of, of the business. I'm not just talking about AEW. I'm talking about collectively all the wrestling promotions from the beginning of time until now. And I thought about it and I said... Why did it have to come to this point? This was the first initial thought that went through my mind. I was just amazed. Like, why does it have to come to this point? And what I mean by that is, why couldn't WWE get it right the first time? Why couldn't WWE make this guy what he was meant to be, which was a top-tier talent, a main event superstar... Which, okay, yes, let's give credit where credit's due. They did put the championship on him. They did give him one or two WrestleMania matches. But CM Punk had brought up a good point where he said none of those were in the the main event, the last match on the card, which was really what kind of killed him, is that he wanted that, that last match of the night. So anyway, I'm looking at the AEW debut and I'm looking at the promo he's cutting and how 
They already get to work. He cuts a promo calling out Darby Allen, and here we go. AEW All Out just got even more exciting. You fast forward to AEW All Out. We're watching the pay-per-view. We were expecting for Daniel Bryan to come out. Adam Cole comes out. And I thought to myself, wow, this guy hadn't even made it to the main roster. He was in NXT, and the very last match that he had against Kyle O'Reilly, the ending of that match was so sudden. Even I was shocked, and that's where I kind of knew that something was up, that Adam Cole was essentially one foot out the door at that point. And mere moments later, after Adam Cole comes out and... uh, turns heel essentially and joins up with Kenny Omega and the rest here comes Brian Danielson aka Daniel Bryan and this killed me even more this is where the resentment went up and the funny thing is I told my friends whom I was watching the pay-per-view with but you know when All Out had just begun I told them I said look I am happy for all these guys if Daniel Bryan makes his debut tonight I won't be angry, I'll actually be happy for the guy because I'm at that point in my life where I truly feel like every person needs to do what they feel is in their best interest. And if people like the likes of CM Punk and Ruby Soho, aka Ruby Riot, uh, Aleister Black and all these guys that are going to AEW, if this is what they felt like is in their best interest and it is in their best interest, then that's what they gotta do. So I told my friend, I said, if Daniel Bryan makes his debut at All Out, it's going to be very bittersweet for me because the way that I look at it as WWE will always be the top wrestling promotion. No matter how much, no matter how bad their TV programming gets, no matter how bad the ratings go down, WWE will always be that one company that I discovered Um, at just 11 years of age and it was the company that hooked me in into watching Monday Night Raw and Smackdown and everything that went along with it but I almost have come to this point where I'm feeling so much resentment like I said before where same thing that I asked with CM Punk I asked with Daniel Bryan why couldn't we get it right the first time why couldn't the creative team the agents the producers or even Vince McMahon himself Why couldn't you guys get it right the first time? Why couldn't you give Daniel Bryan and uh, CM Punk meaningful storylines and actually give them what they are owed? I thought about it and I said, yeah, but when I really, really think about it, there were so many talents who hadn't even scratched the surface yet. I'm talking about Damian Sandow. I'm talking about Wade Barrett. I'm talking about, you know, Ryback. All these guys that were let go, and I truly feel in my heart of hearts that they could have offered something. You know, they were all handed bad storylines and bad gimmicks for some for a select few. And even though, like, I go back to Damien Sandow when he became Damien Mizdow, when he was being the stunt double. It's like, there you go. You wanted this guy to fall flat on his face, and now he's giving you a pop. He's giving you a reaction. He's giving you buy rates. And yet, you still find a way to squander all of that. I don't think that it's so much what you're handed. I think it's how much backing you have from the agents, the producers, and everybody who's running the show in the back. But to come back to the present... Now I'm so much inclined to start watching AEW on a weekly basis because I know for a fact that I'm watching a television program that's not going to insult my intelligence. And the most frustrating part about everything is that is how many chances you you give something or someone. Sometimes there's that expression where sometimes... You can love something, but it doesn't love you back. And that's where it hurts the most. Because I honestly feel like, for example, when CM Punk made his his AEW debut, two days later, if, if I remember correctly, it was SummerSlam. And I was at that point where I said, Vince McMahon and all the agents who are putting this show together better have the best show ever because I know for a fact that WWE's immediate mindset is to counteract what has just happened at a different promotion so that the headlines 
become theirs, not the other promotions. And I felt like Brock Lesnar and Becky Lynch coming back was essentially their surprise response to CM Punk coming to AEW. And the Brock Lesnar aspect of it, I think about it, I'm like, okay, well, Roman just got done feuding with one part-timer. Now he's going to be feuding with another part-timer. And this takes away from people like Cesaro, from, you know, other competitors who can have that opportunity. Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and all these guys. And then you look at the Becky Lynch return, and they completely squashed Bianca. Like, everything that they had built... From the Royal Rumble up until SummerSlam, they had completely squashed. And I even brought up the bright idea that you could have still had Becky Lynch come back. But the circumstances could have been different. Where, for example, Bianca could have had the match with Carmella, had a fair 10-minute match. She retains the title. And maybe, you know, at the end of the match, Becky Lynch comes out and they just have a standoff. And there you go. You establish your new rivalry there. You know, your SummerSlams and your WrestleManias are supposed to be your bookend. They're supposed to be your closure to a story. Or if not a closure, a new beginning to something. And I was just disappointed. And even like when All Out happened, I'm like, okay, maybe they'll spice things up on Raw. Maybe they will get their act together. And no, we're still given meaningless matches, meaningless storylines, storylines that don't go anywhere. It seems like nothing is planned for. There is no backstory to anything. It is very much like I have said with Kamish and Dan the Man. Their mindset, I believe, to be, let's just throw it at the wall. If it sticks, we're going to go with it. And if it, if it drops, we're, we're not going to go with it. I don't hate AEW. I don't look at it as an inferior brand. As a matter of fact, it is every wrestling fan's dream to have a promotion like AEW. Because when you have a promotion where there is a lot of creative control from the superstars, from the wrestlers, from even people who are running the show, that's a healthy dose. But when you have a company like WWE where it's only the agents who are calling the shots of what's going to happen, these guys get watered down, they get stifled, and then they get let go. And then WWE tries to play the, the petty game of trying to get them back and trying to re-sign them and instantly coming to regret it. So I just, again, I don't hate AEW. As a matter of fact, I consider myself a fan. I love what they're doing. And the funny thing is, as I was driving home from the pay-per-view, my buddy and I, we were listening to different wrestling themes because we were just in like, you know, a wrestling mode. And we were listening to Chris Jericho's theme, you know, his Judas theme song from Fozzie. And I thought about how natural everything was, about the fact that Chris Jericho had enough creative freedom to have his own song as his theme song, to be able to do things. Because I don't blame Chris Jericho for walking out. I truly believe that a few years back when it was he and Kevin Owens, they had the most meaningful story on TV. They were the most entertaining. And... I think Chris Jericho is 100% right. They didn't they took the title away from Kevin so it, it became a non-title match and then they were second on the card and it just it was so lackluster and it just it wasn't there. I honestly if you ask me cuz I know some people are under like I know I've heard the commish. I've even heard Dan the man say that uh that WWE wasn't so bad uh right before the pandemic and I have to respectfully disagree. Because the commission and myself, we've had this conversation and I have honestly told him that I felt like the the one point that I can pinpoint where WWE started going downhill was somewhere around 2015. Because if you really think about it, I felt like in 2014 all the way to the beginning of 2015... I felt like we were still getting proper stories that you had, you know, factions like The Shield, like the Wyatt family. You had superstars who each got their own respective stories, like CM Punk, like Daniel Bryan. John Cena had his place on the card. But I feel like in 2015, everything just got focused on just one or two people and everybody else was kind of given the short end of the stick. And I feel like that has followed suit 
up until the pandemic, during the pandemic, and even afterwards. You just feel like the same superstars get recycled and the same superstars have four or five segments in the course of one show. And it just it doesn't feel like anything is progressing. And the part that hurts the most is when you convince yourself that, oh, they'll get their act together. They, they'll, they'll do better. They, they, they will one up, you know, the, the competition and they don't. They are still sticking to their same old song and dance and they're releasing people left, right, and center. I mean, I've had this conversation with so many people that Bray Wyatt, uh, more specifically The Fiend, was your new generation Undertaker. He was that dark character. But I don't, I don't want to drag on for too long about this. I just quickly wanted to get my sentiments out there. I, as a wrestling fan, um, who's basically a longtime WWE fan, um, and as of recent, I've been embracing New Japan Pro Wrestling. I've been embracing AEW and all these other promotions. I truly feel a lot of resentment because I feel like WWE, whether they admit it or not, whether they are upfront with it uh, about it or not, that they have lost a lot of money because they have lost a lot of fresh, good talent that could have given them the best, the best wrestling program in the world. And especially now when you see that NXT is apparently getting rebranded, it goes back to that expression, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Um, and I feel like though it's been the opposite, where if something is doing good or someone is doing good, their immediate response is to uh, squash it because it's going against what they had planned. You know, back in the day, it seems like despite the fact, no matter how many pages of storyline you had written for a certain individual, if somebody else was coming up in the ranks and they were making some noise, you would find a way to integrate them into your weekly programming. You wouldn't try to hold them down because, oh, that goes against what I had planned. That wasn't what I was uh, planning for. So, yeah, this is just me talking. This is me being very personal and intimate. I truly feel so much bitterness um, not against any of the talent that jumped ship or went over. I'm, I'm very happy for them because if they remained in WWE, then they would have been given the same old treatment, meaningless storylines, uh, very gimmicky stuff, and it just it wouldn't have worked out. So I'm happy for the talent. I feel they have made the best move for their career and for themselves financially and just content, you know, happiness wise, but. Um, I do hold a lot of resentment towards, you know, WWE for not getting their act together for not. And that's the thing, too, is I feel like they're not going to change or nothing is going to change anytime soon because they still feel like they're doing everything correctly and that everything is accounted for when it really isn't. So, yeah, I just quickly wanted to talk about this. It's been kind of a... Uh, I've been feeling a lot of emotions over the last few days, like I said, with AEW All Out and with everything that's going on, but uh, WWE, I mean, it, get your stuff together because it's not looking good by any stretch of the imagination. I don't care how much financial backing you might have, you don't get your act together, these guys are gonna, you know... And that's the thing, too, is that I'm not looking for a Monday Night War Part 2. I really am not. I truly feel like every single promotion needs to focus on themselves and put on the best product that they can possibly put. And I feel like AEW is genuinely doing that. They're listening to the fans. They are offering more than just a backstage producer's creative input. Um, you know, and the writers are not stifling or watering down the gimmicks. So yeah, this is where I stand on this matter. It's been a kind of an emotional few days, uh, an emotional 72 hours or so, but this is just coming from me. It's a very personal and intimate episode. And so, I mean, long live both of these uh, promotions, AEW and WWE, but all I can say is that at this point in time, it doesn't seem to be looking good for the WWE, but I will do what I always do. I will give it, a, you know... 
chances for it to you know get better and you know be a better program but we'll just have to see so with all of this said thank you so much guys for tuning into this episode i really appreciate everybody who's been supporting us since day one and i will catch you guys next time (laughs) 